Hey folks, it is September 18th and we're here for the IPFS local offline collaboration call. Um, we're really excited. We have a, a chat with Adam of Natives in Tech today to learn more about what's going on in the Native communities in the U.S. and, and special needs there. Um, but first, I wanted to just, Adam's new to our call. It's awesome to have him here. So we can just do a quick round of intros um, if everybody wants to just tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the offline first space or what you're excited about there. Um, so I'm Terry. I am currently the leader of this fine group. I also run an event called Offline Camp for folks interested in offline first, whether or not that's related to DWeb. Here we talk about the crossover, but there it's a little more broad. Um, and yeah, I work for, um, I work at Protocol Labs and I work primarily on something called Proto School, which offers decentralized web protocol tutorials. So that's me. Uh, Dominic, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. So my name is Dominic and I mostly contribute to Go IPFS. Um, I come to these calls because I'm really interested to see what people work on and hearing the problems that they might be having with it as well. It's, it's always fun to hear the stumbling blocks and then hopefully fix them later. But for when things do go well, I like to broadcast that message as well and carry it forward and say, have you heard about this cool thing? Um, so that's me, yeah. Awesome, Giannis? Yeah, hello, um, I'm Giannis, I am, uh, um, Advisor to research advisor to uh, IPFF, to protocol labs, doing several things around um, uh, IPFS, the P2P content routine, PhD, things uh, related to those areas. Uh, um, yeah, I'm also a lecturer at UCL, uh, where we've been doing research on mobile communications for quite some time. So. Uh, all that sort of um, area is uh, very familiar and uh, yeah, happy to see any progress made in terms of protocols, applications, or what people need actually. Um, yeah. Very cool. Michelle, you want to take a quick sec to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle. I, my handle is often MHC megahertz and different things. Um, I work on the IPFS project. Uh, I do product management and user experience design, uh, specifically and very broadly around um, decentralized data stewardship, how to help people um, steward and manage their own information and data in the way that they find most appropriate and um, culturally supportive. All right, next. Dwayne. Hey, sorry, I joined late. Um, I work at a company that is work, uh, we're, we're doing land administration in Africa and uh, trying to find ways to keep resilient hardware up, uh, resilient software up. So um, that's my professional interest and personally just interested in everything decentralized. So uh, loving learning about this stuff. Cool, and I saved today's special guest for last. So Adam, we can let you both introduce yourself and, oh no, actually, I'm gonna give my spiel first and then I'm gonna let you introduce yourself and give your spiel. Um, so most of you have heard this pitch before, but Offline Camp, which I run, is taking place, we're only like a week and a half out now. Dwayne will be there, all the cool kids are coming. Um, we had to reschedule it because of a wildfire. As far as we know, all the fires are out in the local area. So we'll be in Oregon, September 27th to 30th. And we do still have some tickets available, including sponsorship, uh, scholarships. So if you are interested in coming or if you know someone who is, you know, close enough to travel last minute and might be interested in joining us, it's it's a little bit of a similar vibe to this where we spend a lot of time like in a group discussing interesting issues around offline first. Some of the people are approaching it from DWeb, some of them aren't, but it's all discussion based, very casual, community focused. Uh, my favorite event. So uh, I will pop a link to that both in the chat and in the notes here if anyone's interested, but please help spread the word. And see if there's anyone you know who'd be interested in joining us. I'm just taking a quick look at the agenda. I don't see anything else here yet besides Adam's presentation. So let me turn it over to Adam. Um, I'm super excited. And you can just hit the share button if you want to, Adam, to show us any slides or anything. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I guess I'll do that. 
first. Let's see, share. Um, so you can see so many things going on right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and if I, can you see the presentation mode now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, okay, yeah, my name is Adam Recklow. I'm a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, I, so my father is uh, Muscogee Creek and Uchi, and my mother is uh, English Canadian. Um, so I have three citizenships, um, you know, just in case anything happens. Um, uh, also, I am the uh, founder of Natives in Tech. Um, it is a coalition of uh, native and non-native developers uh, to help uh, basically promote uh, developers that are native that are already working in the software development space. Um, I guess I can go to the next slide here. Um, but yeah, essentially we want to um, promote as well as assert native identity on the web. And we do that by lifting up developers, whether that's kind of like through our blogs and through our conference that we're gonna be having November 9th. Um, we're going to have a fully uh, remote online conference that's, uh, we have eight speakers in the lineup and they're going to be talking about their work. Um, so we work also with non-native developers, like I've already said. Um, a good uh, example of that is uh, the developer who created native-land.ca, which is basically uh, an application that shows the like indigenous territories within each of the, within like the United States. And then they're also working on territories like in Australia as well. Um, so he's, he's not native, but we want to kind of uh, bring together people that are native that are either working in, in development or people that are trying to uh, help and uh, serve native communities. Um, so a big part of our efforts and the work that we want to do is building like open source tools, open source software that supports uh, healthy online uh, native communities. Um, so we do have a, a GitHub organization uh, where I've created like a few different projects. Uh, we have our website um, uh, repo on the GitHub organization. We have this other project that I'm working on, which is a basic uh, search um, Muscogee language search app um, that's also listed as under our uh, GitHub organization. And we're trying to pull in more developers that are working on applications related to you know anything that they're working on um, uh, related to helping to serve native communities so uh, that's kind of the the gist of it um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit we got our status like I think last month um, so we're currently you know progressing and building as an organization it originally started as just a slack group where I was just trying to connect uh, with other native people that were in software development. And we have um, a pretty strong um, a handful of people right now that are in that are pretty active in the Slack group um, and trying to like move that forward by, you know, having an organization. Maybe we get um, can get some grants to also support other initiatives as well. Um, any questions on that? I know it, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I might be coming uh, from a perspective that's maybe not well understood. Um, so if there are any questions, like any types of questions, please feel free to ask. Um, Cause I want to kind of be a uh, uh, liaison, I guess, for my community and as much as I can be for, for other communities with similar experiences. Uh, whoops. Um, one one thing I would like to uh, hear, probably you're going to talk about it, but just in case not, you know, um, what are the challenges that um, uh, you're facing or you're trying to address through this organization? Yeah, yeah. So we will, that will, I will address that and let's see what my next, okay. So I will get to that, I think, in the, in a subsequent slide, but I will talk about, I think, the goals of 
the goals of Names in Tech, and then I can uh, talk about some of the issues that the community that my community I can say my community is facing specifically, and how that might be similar to what other communities are facing. Um, so I think some of the goals, like I said, were building, uh, trying to build open source uh, tools for native communities. And um, I, th I think the, from my perspective, and I think others might have in, in the organization probably have other perspectives on this, but I think you might be wondering, well, you know, kind of why we want to build these. Um, obviously we want them to, connect to resources that are online that can help improve their uh, their lives. But I think also from a cultural perspective, we have a lot of people that um, have smartphones, that have access to applications, that um, those applications are um, probably, if we're talking about like Facebook and uh, Google and some of the larger applications, you know, they're, in most cases, they probably have localization built in, you know, and that's serving you know, broader communities, uh, societies, uh, you know, political states that exist within the world. Um, but those things don't actually trickle down necessarily to indigenous communities. And so um, in that sense, we're not able to necessarily like assert our identity online and to also find resources and, and work with applications that align with our identity, whether it's language or uh, cultural knowledge or um, cultural constructs and concepts. So from my perspective, that's kind of like the one of the main uh, reasons for wanting to promote uh, building applications that serve Native communities so that, you know, when someone goes online, they can consume content that is, you know, in their language or uh, using constructs that they understand. Um, because otherwise, if they're using things like Facebook and and other kinds of, of resources, you know, they're they're consuming, you know, other modes of thought, other modes of of uh, language and communication, and so um, that then becomes a way in which they identify, and that changes, you know, the way that they they can see themselves. So, I think it's very important that we do construct these applications so that we can uh, assert our identity. Um, we can, uh, among, amongst our community members, and we can have uh, uh, stronger presence within the community and help uh, shape and promote and further, you know, our cultural um, knowledge. So that's kind of like the perspective that I'm coming from. So just to kind of give some context on that. Um, so specifically uh, for myself, I have looked into uh, IPFS. Um, I've used it locally on my computer. I've looked into PWAs, which are progressive web applications. I looked into offline first, and uh, there are a lot of cases where mobile applications do have offline first capabilities built in, uh, which is nice. Um, I just heard about mesh networking literally like two days ago, someone was mentioning it. Um, and I don't know much about it now, but it seems like it could be a solution for um, uh, helping other people to uh, have a, a network connection through like peer-to-peer -peer sharing. I've looked into blockchain in the sense of like decentralized, you know, web application size frameworks that can help with this as well, where you don't have all the information on like one server, but on several, you know, hundreds of peers. Um, and also just like peer-to-peer -peer networks, which I suppose IPFS is a part of as well as blockchain and things of that nature. Um, so I think there are things that there are many things that I, I want to work on. This is one of those and, you know, things that I know that I can do at least with, um, for example, the native and tech website is um, I can uh, make it a progressive web app by caching the HTML content and having it served by a web worker, for example. There, there are things that, that we can do right now, which I haven't spent too much time on because I'm doing several different things, but, um, I think it helps also to, to be aware of like just different techniques and um, resources and tutorials that you can learn from to, to help implement these kinds of things. So, um, and to and to then uh, in turn kind of make it like the de facto way in which you make applications. I think that's where we kind of want to go, or at least where I want to take the applications that I'm working on, where 
offline first and you know whatever the the methodology becomes a de facto way in which i'm able to build these apps in order to serve communities that are not well connected so that's kind of like uh, the goals of, of the what, what i'm trying to achieve if there's no questions i'll i'll move on to the next slide um, have you, um, so maybe it's a question for later, but um, <clears throat> there are community-based ISPs and things like that. Is that any related to things that um, you're doing or have you collaborated or reached out to them in any way? Hello? We lost you, Adam. We're missing your video and audio at the moment. Adam. Hmm. You still hearing us, Adam? Hmm. We need an offline first collaboration mode here. <laughs> We're just doing a little advertisement for. <laughs> the internet that might work someday. I'm sure Adam will be back with us in a moment. This is when it's exciting that the presenter is not the one also recording, but saying that I will now drop off. Because that's how my life works. It's building the excitement. It is. Mm -hmm. Jeopardy theme song, anyone? Sorry? Jeopardy theme Some song? Some cold music. <laughs> Dwayne, do you have a secret extra guest for our call that we don't know about? Just choosing not to introduce themselves? Because yes. that could be remedied during this pause. This is Trent Larson. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Trent. Working at the side here, but uh, also very interested in this topic. So, awesome! Yeah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> there we go. Hi, Adam. Uh, sorry about Hello. that. Hello. No worries. Handle. You really Slack. hated Giannis's question, huh? He couldn't handle Slack and Zoom and all <laughs> the. Once I think I've never seen no that. No problem. Okay. Oh, I missed a question, I think. Or did I miss uh, a Right. So uh, I was just saying that there are some uh, initiatives to build um, community-based ISPs. Um, so are these, have you um, considered using any of that technology? Is it of interest to provide connectivity? Um, I mean, even low rate connectivity or, um, yeah, I know a few initiatives. Uh, yeah, there, there are like, um, I know a few communities that are, I think what you're talking about, uh, are you referencing like um, communities creating like the networking, like the fiber broadband connectivity for different communities? Um, I'm yes, sure, so, like, so there, there, um, there are several different types. I think uh, some of them it's just user equipment in terms of antennas that are put uh, by users, and therefore they can connect over wireless medium to you know a uh, whole um, village or whatever. Uh, but there are also uh, others that they're actually building infrastructure and getting support. Um, from local councils to build um, uh, you know, infrastructure and connect people, uh, such as grid uh, .net and those things. Yeah, I think um, I just know of a, I guess, I guess I just know of one community that is building actual like the fiber network, like within their community in order to connect them to uh, the internet. Um, so, we will, in the presentation, kind of discuss maybe some of the barriers to that in the sense of 
um, you know, the funds that are available and having access to resources, uh, having access to like grant funding and stuff. Michelle, I saw you had your hand up. Do you want to throw something in quickly before we? Oh, uh, well, I was just going to say, I, I think Adam will probably cover it later, but I, yeah. I think the community based ISP thing, Adam, I know you linked to the recent um, NPR article about the Have I Supai um, Tribal Council and the work they've been doing. I think that would fall under that category. So you probably are getting there later in your presentation. So I will leave it to you. <laughs> cool. All right. We can see your screen again now, Adam. Awesome. Okay. Please don't shut off. Um, okay. So I, um, I was trying to get some general information. NPR has like some articles on this um, and they have like a few different articles related to uh, connectivity. Um, so NPR is a good uh, resource to, to find uh, some information on this. Um, but back in 2018, there was an article that was on NPR. And this was related to a census saying that 53% um, of uh, Native peoples are connected to the internet, which is, they said, the lowest for uh, any uh, racial group, I guess, is how they categorized it in the United States. Um, and that probably, um, to kind of give that some more context, I mean, that's probably a very broad spectrum. I mean, we do have uh, reservations that are very rural and, and isolated, uh, but we also have reservations that are, you know, literally in the city. So it's, it's hard to compare. And um, my advice is when working with the community, you know, just try to, to figure out and understand kind of, you know, where, you know, understand like what kind of issues they're facing because you can't just, you know, apply, um, you know, certain solutions that, you know, don't make sense in that in certain cases. So, so if we're going to like talk, and just to kind of, you know, give an example, like there's um, the city of Gallup is where the um, uh, Navajo reservation is. And, you know, it is very rural. Um, not, it, it is, uh, you could say like a larger town-ish uh, type of size. Um, but they probably have like low connectivity, whereas like a reserve, like the Hollywood reservation, which is where the Seminoles are um, in Hollywood, Florida, like they're right in like a big city. So their connectivity is going to be very high, whereas the other ones might be very low. Um, and again, you know, every, every reservation is different. So just, you know, if you are working with um, tribal communities, you know, try to, you know, look at. Uh, those issues and, and see, you know, where the actual concerns are and, and where things can be worked on. Um, but, th but there are, you know, just other, you know, reasons that probably that are maybe obvious for some people. Um, but, you know, there's in, in the rural areas uh, where, res where some reservations are, there is like little or no, you know, broadband service. And um, that's also related to cell phone connectivity as well. So not only do they, you know, not have access uh, to internet, but uh, the phone service might be really low, so they're not getting connectivity that way either. Um, and there's also issues with how these grants are being awarded. So um, uh, NPR, I think, did some research or uh, a nonprofit organization did research and found that you know, less than 1% of government grants are being awarded to Native nations to actually implement, you know, these actual things that we're talking about, like, you know, um, creating the networking and the infrastructure uh, and other things. So even though there are funds that are available, um, either they're not being awarded in terms of, um, I think the tribes might not necessarily know, they might not have the technical um, a grant skill set to apply or, or to, um, you know, understand the technical details of setting up that kind of infrastructure. So there's, there's also maybe like a, a skills gap between um, the work, you know, that needs to be done and the people that live within those communities that want to actually, you know, get those grants. So, um, so these are kind of some of the reasons, you know, why there's you know, low connectivity in these areas. And uh, specifically in my community, the, 
I'm, I live in. Uh, uh, oh, I'm assuming everyone else got to enjoy that performance also. Hello. We need like a good activity for these little breaks. What do we do? Hmm. Charades. You have to do it. Uh. They're very appropriate breaks for this particular meeting, as I'm sure you all know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they are. This is, internet is lovely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here we go, restarting. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Something uh, I'd like to talk about sometime, it doesn't have to be now, because we may not have the time to, um, but uh, I've recently been interested in learning about how people deal with schema changes in a dis distributed type of um, environment. So if you're offline first and you can expect that some of your um, peers in an application are slowly being updated over the course of weeks or months or years, um, how do you deal with older application versions wanting to communicate with newer versions and so forth? One, yeah, that's that is a one. good topic. <laughs> Let's see. Is this Adam or is this someone new this year? There we go. Ooh, oh, Adam and a new person. Bonus. Wait. Yes. Who's Dav? This is very exciting. Issue, I think. Either way. Sorry. All right. About that. We'll let Dav go low profile, go low profile for the moment. Profile. All right, Adam. Take it away. Carry on. Okay, let me get back to sharing. Let's see. Okay, um, so we were talking about points about connectivity. I don't know if there were any questions related to that. If not, I will go to the next point. Um, so I have my charger plugged in, so hopefully we can continue. Um, so I think another element about this, which I think is important to talk about is you have the connectivity issue, you have um, you know, issues of uh, you know, cell phone, you know, you know, the amount of uh, access or um, data that they can get through cell phone service. Um, but I think there's also points related to the culture. So um, native communities are going to be very close or, you know, kids are going to be raised by not just their parents, but their grandparents, aunts and uncles. Um, Cause you might just say, well, you know, they don't have access to this information you know, they could technically, you know, move somewhere closer where they do have connection. Um, but it's not such an easy, you know, thing to do, um, you know, when, when you're part of a, con a close connected network. Um, so from, from my perspective, I realized that this could be an opportunity where um, if students, if, if people that were living in remote communities that were, you know, living with their family, if they could just have internet access, if they just had that by itself, then they could, um, you know, through resources on the web, be able to learn, you know, web development. Then through that, they could, you know, potentially uh, start working remotely for companies or start building things themselves that they'd like to. And through that, then they could be you know, uh, you know, bring, you know, wealth into their community, into their family, be able to help those around them. Um, and so I really see like internet connectivity as a major um, a barrier to uh, achieving that. Um, but 
because of the close knit, you know, nature of the families and uh, the clans and the communities, um, it's a perfect opportunity if once they're able to get connectivity to then be able to, you know, transform their education, transform, you know, their their living through, um, you know, what they learn online and the opportunities that they can get online. Um, but, you know, we get into this cyclical pattern where, you know, they, okay, so they don't have internet connectivity. Um, and so they don't have the resources. And so without the resources, whether that's, you know, financially to then be able to build that infrastructure, you know, again, they cannot get that connectivity, you know, to, to be able to get that information. Um, so, uh, so I think in general, though, uh, achieving this would, I think, you know, be uh, really incredible just because, um, you know, it would give them the opportunity to continue to, you know, be close to their family, but have uh, the opportunity to learn and grow and to um, be able to um, uh, have a good uh, uh, way of living or a good salary in order to um, whether for themselves or to help their community, help their family, things of that nature. Um, so those are just some of the points about the culture that I wanted to bring up as well. Something, uh, I don't know, Adam, if uh, this is something that comes up in, in um, your community, but uh, a certain amount of separation or segregation also can be an advantage in evolving different approaches to things. So while, while connectivity is a problem in some ways, it could also mean that um, unique solutions are only possible in that environment. Uh, you know, like whether it's, um, you know, I, internet identity that carries with you in a way that communities with you. I don't know. I don't know how that would work, but I, uh, I know like some other communities, like the, the maker community, if you're familiar with maker spaces and so forth, um, they're uh, very, very cash strapped. And so a lot of their solutions end up being really brilliant cheap solutions to things um, that a very well uh, um, a well paid company for example or, or people in an in a academic environment would never think of because they just they don't have the same constraints mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and I think I think um, yeah I think that's a really good point and I think introducing these ideas to the community can uh, I think start to have those conversations. I think me taking the time to uh, spend time in those communities can, can also promote these conversations. But yeah, I think providing at least, you know, some resources to them and to then allow them to innovate, like what you're saying, I think is, yeah, another way in which to, to spur these actions. I want to jump in along those lines, besides the maybe innovation that could come about, uh, we're seeing how outside in the US, there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty that come with our new technologies that make it hard for uh, beginners to innovate. Whereas in these areas, like we're seeing in Africa, uh, those could be more ripe for actually creating new business ideas that have a little bit more leeway and freedom to you know apply in our case cryptocurrencies but all kinds of other business ideas that might not be practical outside the area mm -hmm. and i've even thought about okay there's i'm not I'm not sure if you've worked in this space or not uh Duane, um but the um i know there was like some service where there was like sms text messaging that was letting community members know like where there were, um, I think it was related to um, uh, hardware as well, but just letting community members know like where water was available and they could like, um, you know, use their uh, cell phone and, and, tech, and SMS messaging in order to get that information. Uh, but yeah, there's, yeah, a lot of ideas that I think, yeah, we're not even thinking of because, you know, we're not in that space. Yeah, so it's so interesting how we're completely like oblivious to things that don't fit with our own experience of our, in my case, very first world and privileged day to day. 
Um, but I love, we hear a lot from, you know, folks like Duane who are involved in projects in Africa or occasionally someone who is actually uh, from, from another community that has those constraints. That's really cool. I just wanted to mention that there are a number of articles on the offline camp medium publication that touch on some of those kinds of use cases like disaster recovery with uh, mesh networks or those kinds of things. So if you're looking for some suggestions for like more constrained environments, you might find a few starting points there. I'll pop the link in the notes. So cool. I'll let you get back to it, Adam. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I have an observation. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm David. Um, I don't know if, if you guys talk, talk about um, emergency cases, for example, um, something like if any um, natural disaster or something like that, uh, could all the connections uh, across uh, some area. Uh, maybe the, this kind of technology can um, help uh, to communicate between persons in a affected uh, area for any reason. Uh, it's all, it's my, my comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are cases where, like at least here in, uh, uh, Oklahoma we have tornadoes so like um, and they're pretty they can be pretty prevalent south of where I'm living uh, but also in kind of this general area and they might not necessarily have access to uh, yeah that information in regards to you know natural disasters uh, but even if they did you know what if the natural disaster knocks out a power line or knocks out a service you know then you know would there be something there in, in that downtime, in the intermediate time that could still, you know, help them to communicate with one another? So, yeah. And so, yeah, I think there is definitely uh, work where that can be done. Um, okay, so I'll go to the next slide. Um, these are just like a few of the, I think, things that kind of come to mind as well when we talk about uh, having like an online, I guess, persona or identity. And, you know, as it pertains to indigenous peoples, you know, they, they um, can be very private about information, like especially if it's cultural or ceremonial in nature. Uh, but at the same time, if they don't put in like certain safeguards in, in relation to their online identity, then, you know, that information could potentially leak out, you know, to people that they don't want knowing it. Um, and so, uh, so it's not, it's, it's, uh, there's, you know, a general knowledge gap, there's, you know, maybe a gap in terms of connectivity. Um, but there's also just a gap in terms of, you know, what it means to be, I guess, an online citizen. Um, so if there is information that they're sending to other people, you know, if it's through Facebook Messenger, you know, that information is probably being um, um, probably being recorded uh, and downloaded. And it may not be information that they want shared or that they want anyone to really know because it's, you know, very private or ceremonial or spiritual in nature. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it should be important to, if they are able to connect to a web interface and they are engaging with web applications and we also need to inform uh, these community members about you know using two-factor authentication probably um, you know tr using something that helps make their uh, maybe a password manager that makes it easy to create passwords um, to know the differences uh, between using firefox and chrome or between using DuckDuckGo and google search in terms of searching for information uh, you know, social media and email, you know, if they use Gmail, for example, maybe that information is, you know, being collected up. So again, um, you know, these are things that they probably, you know, that aren't really like, um, you know, explicit when you sign up for a service, or, or maybe they are in the sense that if you're really into the fine details, and you want to read like the end user, you know, agreement on things. Um, but I think for most users, they're not really going to be educated in this area. And they may be sharing information that, you know, shouldn't be known by anyone outside of the community, you know, whether it's, um, you know, on a hard drive or not, and it's not really being looked into at all. But, you know, 
maybe they just don't want it uh, to be out there. Um, and then also, um, from my perspective, I think there is a lot of opportunity, I, th I think, for, for e-commerce, because when working with uh, indigenous communities, uh, you know, there is a tradition of uh, regalia or uh, beyond that, um, just art, you know, there's a lot of artisans within the community. And um, because they're rural, you know, they could, they could take advantage of, you know, e-commerce and in ways that can, you know, help their way of life. And so, um, but at the same time, they have to also get up to speed, you know, on what e-commerce is and, and um, using a platform and getting familiar with the platform and how they specifically do e-commerce. So currently, um, I see a lot of community members that post on Twitter, you know, they'll say, hey, you know, I made some earrings or, you know, hey, I made this, uh, you know, you know, let me know, you know, who wants them. And so I think that there is uh, not not a big gap, but I think a small gap in terms of uh, for those that are on Twitter, um, there might be a small gap in terms of e-commerce and knowing like certain platforms to use, um, but they too also come with their own costs. I think, I don't know if there's some that have no overhead and maybe some that have, you know, a subscription model, but either way, you know, I think that there are areas in which um, artisans within these communities can also plug into and take advantage of, uh, you know, the, the commerce that's happening, you know, on the web today. Um, any questions on that? Okay, um, so yeah, uh, I guess my uh, presentation is coming to a close. Um, I just wanted to share uh, our social media. So like I was saying before, we have a GitHub account, uh, we have a Twitter, uh, Twitter account, uh, we have a Slack uh, group, and you can, uh, this, the nativesintech.herokuapp.com is the uh, invite, um, uh, yeah, the, in, the site application that allows you to be invited into the Slack group. Uh, we have a form, which is a, uh, our discourse instance, and we have a LinkedIn. Um, so this is just some of the social media platforms that we're on in order to kind of, you know, get the word out about our work. And uh, at the end here, we have like uh, some information related to uh, resources. Um, so these are kind of some of the articles that I read to and to get like uh, uh, see what other communities are going through uh, outside of the Muscogee Creek Nation here in Oklahoma. And uh, Arizona State University put together some nice information related to uh, the digital divide. So hopefully these are all resources that you all can can use uh, to uh, educate you know yourselves on some of the uh, issues that some tribes are facing that are more isolated. And um, so yeah, I guess that kind of uh, concludes my presentation. Uh, sorry for uh, dropping in and out here and there, um, but thank you. No worries, you're just emphasizing the need for stuff that works offline, so we're cool with it. Cool. I'm going to stop sharing. We have about 10 minutes left if people have questions. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, but I don't know, feel free to ignore or uh, move on to uh, whatever you like. Um, one, um, so we we work uh, we, we work with land administration in Zambia, and um, in Zambia, a lot of the native uh, indigenous lands haven't necessarily been even, um, uh, like incorporated with the government of Zambia, and so there's um, some ambiguities. There's also some other processes that are work being worked on to try to allow local. Uh, ownership or, or administration of these lands. They're basically communal lands. And I imagine some of those things are very similar. Um, but are you, I guess, uh, I'm just curious if, you're, if there's any overlap in some of the things we're doing there with what 
uh, some of the problem sets that exist in, in uh, the Americas or if it's um, uh, kind of well established. I guess it's been, we've been <laughs> colonists. <laughs> My ancestors have been here for a long time and um, you've been here longer. So maybe it's well established. I don't know. Um, how does that, how is that working out? Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's there's definitely communities that are rural in Oklahoma that are just being served by the Muscogee Creek Nation or by uh, tribal nations as opposed to this the state, kind of like what you're, I think, what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think the Muscogee Creek Nation kind of does put the responsibility on their shoulders to whatever it might be. It might be like paving roads. It might be like servicing, um, you know, providing medical assistance to people out in rural areas. And so, yeah, I think I, I think in our situations, we, we might be in a similar situation in the sense that, you know, the, the, the local, I guess, uh, tribes are the ones taking the initiative on some of those things. So, yeah, I mean, I think that um, in that sense, it kind of, there is opportunity to then work specifically with, you know, those tribal, with the, with the tribal nations here um, in terms of, you know, establishing uh, what it might be internet connectivity, it might be cell phone service, you know, whatever it might be and not having necessarily to go through a, maybe a much larger bureaucracy, like with the states uh, to, to get some of these questions answered or, or to see like what opportunities there are. I think we're going to have more talk about this with you specifically later because we've talked about designs of the administration system. It's basically recording what ownership is. And it's, the idea of ownership is different in different areas and there's different kinds of ownership. And so, you know, I, I think it'll be interesting to hear uh, later in the, the conversation how we could either deploy something that would be useful in that context or something that there's an overlap between the, that ownership and overall state ownership that surrounds it and just uh, determining what gets to be paired. Maybe it's just a little bit and, and that would be a very interesting design for us. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, yeah. Did you have another question as well? Oh, I had one other, yeah. So. Um, I was curious about uh, some, it seems like you've been quite successful personally in, in bridging that, a lot of these gaps that you're talking about. And I'm curious, have there been some things that you've seen that are replicable in your story that could be applied to um, some, of the, uh, some of the native areas or, or communities that you're seeing? Yeah, so there's definitely more work to be done. Um, I've kind of just, uh, I just moved out here um, like a month ago, a couple months ago. And so I'm kind of now just having conversations with the Muscogee Creek Nation, as well as uh, there's a coding boot camp that's close to here called Coding Dojo. Um, so I'm just now like trying to start conversations and to like let them know that this is an opportunity for them to that I think aligns with uh, a lot of people's way of life in terms of, you know, within their community and uh, wanting to, because for anyone that's gotten into development, it, it's not easy. Um, it can be very, you know, difficult. You can want to pull your hair out at times. You can just want to quit uh, sometimes. And I think what we're trying to do at least at least right now is to say, okay, there are opportunities. Let us be a support network for you. Let us, you know, um, build, because we, because we have the network like on Slack where people can communicate and talk to each other. Um, so if you do want to get into development, let us be a network and support group for you. And because, you know, we, it, it, it helps to, I think, find a support group of people that you identify with and, you feel more comfortable around it. So at this moment in time, you know, building up that support network and then um, hopefully in the near future, we can actually, you know, work with people in the community that want to uh, get into the field 
And then from there, um, people that are uh, closer to, uh, you know, remote and rural areas that have a support network that have uh, been successful, then they can start to replicate that for other people as well in the community. So um, I think that that can also work for other uh, tribal nations here. So um, there are other communities, uh, for example, the Kiowa that are doing uh, camps for um, students in middle school and high school. Um, so I have connected with them. Um, I haven't necessarily gone out and, and worked with them yet, but there are other tribal nations that are interested, as, including the Osage as well, which are just north of here. So there, I, th I think right now I'm just trying to uh, build it with one community and then hopefully, you know, that can be replicated out. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't know. Did I answer your question, Giannis, about ISPs? I think you had another one. But if I did. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Adam, I don't know. Obviously, there's there are travel expenses involved, but I don't know if you might know some tribal communities that are closer to the Oregon area where there might be someone who'd be interested in coming to offline camp with one of the scholarships that we still have left, or even if a couple of people. I'm not sure what would be the right way to, yeah. to reach those folks. I think, um, so what I could do is if you send that information, I can send it out on in our Slack group and then I'll also sure. I'll send it out on Twitter and that hopefully can reach, you know, a big audience. Okay, perfect. I'll email you all the, all the relevant details. Thanks. Cool, cool. Yep. So. This is great. Thank you, Adam. It's cool. always always neat to hear a new perspective on, particularly with like communities that we're that not all of us have the exposure to. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, we. So, uh, yeah. I'll just plug. I'll just plug the um, the GitHub group again. Like, if you want to contribute and you know help us on GitHub and you know send some commits our way, that'd be great. If if you have like, uh, also just I guess send me information. Um, I think you have my email, Terry. Uh, so if anyone has like more resources, you just brought up Protocol Labs, I, I think. It, there's tutorials for information, which I didn't know about before. Um, so yeah, I'd like to take a look at that. Uh, but yeah, if, if anyone wants to like, uh, you know, collaborate on something, yeah, feel free to, you know, speak with me and we can figure out you know, what we can do. I, I wanted to go to the, offline conference um it's kind of not the best time with yeah. work um but uh yeah i would like to set out a date uh further in the future and so that i can attend yeah that'd be great and we certainly do our best after the event to kind of summarize discussions that happen and share them in writing so that medium publication is a great place to catch up on some of the interesting stuff that's come out of past discussions um, Oh, I was just going to say, we usually host these on the third Wednesday of the month, which would be October 16th for the next one. And we don't have a specific topic or presenter yet for that one. So people can be thinking about whether there's something they'd like to share. We will have had offline camp in between. So it might be that we'd have some folks from offline camp sharing some of the interesting discussions from there, or we could look at a specific presenter. But um, I suspect we might have a bigger crowd than usual after offline camp, so we'll see how it goes. But um, if anyone is not doing this already, the repo, oh, I know what else I was going to suggest. Adam opened an issue in, the, uh, in our repo about this, this particular use case, so that might also be a good place for people to have some discussion um, and reach Adam there. Um, yeah, but if you follow the repo. I'll find the link in here. <laughs> here somewhere um, because this is where I announce the call dates and if you're I can like tag you in the issue so that you actually get an email to remind you that the calls exist so 
but great to see everybody today. Cool. And I'll, uh, I'll send out a link to the video of this in our recap. So feel free to share with anyone or Adam, if you want to share the, the video more broadly as a place to share your presentation, please feel free to do that. So thank you. We'll be in YouTube. Cool. Thanks for organizing. All right. Thanks yeah. to see everyone. Thanks, and nice to see you, David. We're bummed that we don't get to see you at camp. We'll uh, see you all later. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye.